Good morning. We have some folks. Hi, Kip. You're number one here today. Oh, we've got lots of other folks coming in. Barry and Margot and Ken and Robin Allen. Good morning. Good morning to you. Hope everybody's well. Hi, Norma Bentley. And Bob Ando is with us too. And Joan Riggs, hello. I hope everybody's doing well. Welcome to Holy Week. It is Holy Week. The week before Easter. And uh, so it's an opportunity for us to be a little bit more reflective and intentional as we do this. So uh, hi, Helen England, Larry and Carolyn Thomas, my Aunt Mary. Good morning to you. Talked to my son Tom last night on the phone and talked about Aunt Mary. Hi, Nancy. Judy Martin, good morning. Hi, Deanna. Good morning to you. Don Jones is with us and Judy Hatch. So many people joining us. Kevin and Chris Vaughn. Good to see you all. So as I said, it is. Um, Got to stop saying good morning and tell you what's going on here a little bit. So, um, uh, oh, Joanne Butters and a prayer for Jean Hardwick, who's in the hospital. Obviously, yes, Jean is a um, special person from Concord, Michigan. Jean Hardwick. Hope she's all right and will recover here. Um, so we are in Holy Week, which is uh, we're still we're still kind of in Lent, right? But it's Holy Week, so. We had, we, we had Palm Sunday with a bit of the passion thrown in yesterday during our worship service, just in case some folks couldn't be with us all then. Hi, good, good morning, Judy Sutherland. And um, the, um, but really it's the, it was the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem onto that Passover celebration week. And uh, the fact that uh, he was, he was a thumb in the eye of the religious authorities and represented a, a, a huge um, liability to the peace that Rome required. So the setup is there. Um, people have sworn their allegiance to not only to Jesus as a, as, as a prophet, but also as a savior and as a king. And then during the course of the week, as he continues to represent the ideals of the kingdom, of course, he's going to find himself increasingly alone. And uh, I think that that's one of our focuses of Holy Week is that aloneness that Jesus felt um, and that he stood in for us, right? So it's an important, important lesson for us. And uh, hi, Sandy Sauerbeck, Barbara Wolf, good morning. So uh, that's, that's our focus. Now, the, here's the interesting thing about Holy Week. Holy Week, I really should say it should be Holy Weekend, right? Because uh, in the Protestant church, we don't do an awful lot, right? Now, if in a high liturgy church, there would be masses and there would be um, mantons and things all through the Holy Week. They would be a holy vigil, right? So like we even say, I was talking to my son, Tom, who's, you know, organist at, the, at a big Catholic parish down in Houston, St. John Vianney. And um, he is, um, talks about the triennium, which is, very Catholic word, but it represents the three things that happened, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter Vigil, right? And the Easter Vigil would be uh, the time from the death of Christ on Good Friday, the third hour of the watch, as they would say, uh, and um, all the way up until Easter morning, and they would have somebody present in the sanctuary. And uh, they would also do music, have musical accompaniment. We don't go that far. But we do represent Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. And I will tell you, it, when I was growing up, um, never, they were never huge uh, events, services. I mean, you kind of had to seek them out. But we do it here at Allen Park. And so if you'd like to, come join us on Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. 
for a communion service uh, that represents that first last supper and uh, and some of the events and then obviously it ends with Jesus um, being arrested and taken for trial um, and then we have our Good Friday which is represents the hours that Jesus was on the uh, cross and then the death of Jesus and then it goes into Easter Vigil but we'll do 7 p.m. on on Friday Good Friday also to have that very meaningful services welcome you all and um, again we're, our planning is to be live on our broadcast both on uh, on Facebook and on YouTube now um, the other news of course Easter is Sunday lots of stuff going on we're gonna have a 7 a.m. sunrise service sunrise is at 702 so we've got to organize so that we but uh, that'll be out on the north lawn weather permitting and right now the weather looks really really good sunny and 56 during the day it'll be a little chillier in that morning but that'll be out on the north lawn and we will broadcast that on Facebook live um, but it won't be on YouTube until afterwards we'll upload it to YouTube and uh, and then we have at 9 a.m. Uh, for the kids bring your kids and we'll have an Easter egg hunt that's being arranged by Deanna who's with us and also um, I know Chuck Olette has promised to help with that so they're looking for some help go ahead and make that ask and then um, and then we have um, um, our sanctuary service uh, with communion that will be held on at 10 a.m. so come on buy if you can Easter is one of these things that you know it's best I, I don't want to say, I think that it's most effective for us and the celebration when we're together so if you can make it to church yeah, that would be great so anyway uh, hi Mark how are you so I prattled on here three minutes longer than usual but there's a lot going on here with all the Easter stuff I don't know what's going on with uh, um, is uh, grief share meeting on Thursday Maybe uh, we can have Norma or Carrie put in for that. Obviously, yes. So prayers for Teresa. Judy Martin is asking for her 94-year-old cousin. So we will certainly include those. Yep, and we'll have that prayer for Jean also. As we do, we want to remember the family, just all of the Johnsons, the the uh, passing. Oh, no reshare this Thursday. Okay, and. Um, the passing of Scott Johnson at 73. So our prayers go up for Becky and Patty and Andy and Connor, and Bailey, all the rest of the Johnson family. Uh, Saturday, uh, April 22nd, uh, visitation at 11, service to follow at 12 right here at the church for that. Okay, let's see here. Barbara Wool, I think I got all those things. I'm going to go here. Yep, I just want to make sure that I caught up on that. So we're going to go ahead and start in on our Holy Monday, right? Um, on uh, Holy Week, we're going to do our devotions. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is do my breathing discipline. Breathe in for five, hold it for five, excel for five. If you'd like to, feel free. Here we go. All right, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. All right, our opening devotion for today is uh, Psalm 119, verses 73 through 80. So let's listen for the word of the Lord for us today. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. I know O oh Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have humbled me. Let your steadfast love become my comfort, according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the arrogant be put to shame, because they have subverted me with guile. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, so that they may know your decrees. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, so that I may not be put to shame. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. So here's something to consider as we are in Holy Week. It said, um, 
Let those who fear you turn to me so that they may know your decrees. May my heart be blameless in your statutes so that I may not be put to shame. So the one perfect person that we do know of is Jesus, right? And here, remember, as we go through this, that he was blameless, right? Yet uh, he took on. He took on the separation and the darkness of the world and what he did. So um, this uh, moment of resurrection is so much more than just the miracle that it was of the dead coming to life, but it was transformation also. That's what we seek in Easter is the transformation, to be Easter people at all times. There's an old saying that we are Easter people, people of hope, right, in a Good Friday world, a world that uh, just lives for itself, which is limited to power and wealth, right? All right, we're going to move. I'm not going to say on because we're in Jeremiah, but we're actually taking a pretty big step back. We were up in the 24, 25 chapters. Now we're back in 11. So we're going to see um, lectionary um, presents us with this. So let's see what God's word for us in Jeremiah chapter 11 is today and 12. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to slaughter. And I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you... O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution against them, upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. You will be in the right, O Lord, when I lay charges against you. But let me put my case to you. Why does the way of the guilty prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them, and they take root. They grow and bring forth fruit. You are near in their mouths, yet far from their hearts. But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and test me. My heart is with you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the grass of every field wither? For the wickedness of those who live in it, the animals and the birds are swept away because people say he is blind to our ways. You have raced with front runners, and they have wearied you. How will you compete with horses? And in a safe land you fall down. How will you fare in the thickets of the Jordan? For even your kinsfolk and your own family, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Do not believe them, though they speak friendly words to you. I have forsaken my house, I have abandoned my heritage, I have given the beloved of my heart into the hands of her enemies. My heritage has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has lifted up her voice against me, and therefore I hate her. Is the hyena greedy for my heritage at my command? Are the birds of prey all around her? Go, assemble all the wild animals, bring them to devour her. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it into a desolation. Desolate, it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate, but no one lays it to heart. Upon all the bare heights in the desert, spoilers have come, for the sword of the Lord devours <clears throat> from one end of the land to the other. No one shall be safe. They have sown wheat and reaped thorns. They have tired themselves, but profit nothing. They shall be ashamed of their harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Thus says the Lord concerning all my evil neighbors who touch the heritage that I have given my people Israel to inherit. I am about to pluck them up from their land, and I will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And after I have plucked them up, I will again have compassion on them. And I will bring them again to their heritage and to their land, every one of them. And then if they diligently learn the ways of my people by to swear by to, uh, to by my name 
as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my family, my people. But if any nation will not listen, then I will completely uproot it and destroy it, says the Lord. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. Whoa. So there's just so much to this because given the fact that it's Holy Week, I have a hard time not reading anything in the light of the cross, right? Or, or I read through the cross. And, you know, here we see somebody who has been picked as a prophet and God saying, hey, um, um, I, Jeremiah is talking to God. I know this stuff. I see this stuff and I understand it. But I got questions, God. So let me ask you a question, right? It says, I know you're going to be right and I know it's your will, but let me let me put my case to you. And he's looking around himself and he sees all the wrongs in the world, right? Why is it that the people who are guilty are prospering? Excuse me. Why are all the treacherous thriving, right? You planted them, God, right? And so what part do you have in this? Don't you have a responsibility? I mean, this is his frustration, right? But then it says here, I have forsaken my, this is what Jeremiah has done, right? His family told him he was crazy. Jesus, his family said the same thing. They came after him and said, hey, we think he's got a demon in him. So we can see this through the cross. We can see that these have attributes that Jesus picks up for us at this time of Easter. Okay. And always that hope, because all these words of the heritage, but how important that is, because God says, I'm picking you up, I'm plucking you up, and taking you away from it, so that we might reestablish it in the right way, and I will return it to you. Right? We'll return it to you. We'll move into our New Testament reading. We're in the book of Philippians, which I read during service yesterday, but we were in the second chapter, that verse 1 through 11, the kenosis, the self-emptying of Christ, Christ being um, equal with God, co-eternal with God, and but lowers himself, empties himself, right, of that divinity so that he might take our place on that cross. But uh, so this letter of joy, and we were in that second chapter, but now we're in the third chapter, so he's talking about the problems that... Uh, these early followers of Jesus are presenting, right? Because they don't, they don't have to get it right. So again, the Judaizers, the people who say, you need to become Jewish until you, you have to become Jewish first to follow Jesus. So you have to obey all these laws, including circumcision. So um, here we go. Let's read what we might have for us in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and for you, it is a safeguard. So I'm going to pause right there. I'm saying these things again, right? Don't worry about it. It's not angering me, but I'm just saying because I want you to be double sure about what I'm telling you here. This is important. Listen. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. It's the circumcision. For it is we who are the circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, sell it persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have had to come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but rather one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based in faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on 
to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the price of the heavenly call, prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. We had our 90th anniversary last year, and we had a little special celebration. And if you remember, our Bible verse for that was pressing on, which comes from here, right? Don't, don't, uh, and, and Paul lays out saying here, look, I know these people who are the Judaizers that saying you got to become Jewish. That, that's not true because look, right? If there was anybody who would say that that is necessary, it's me because I was born Jewish of the tribe of Benjamin, right? I was the most zealous Jewish person that you would find. I persecuted the early church, right? So if it was about that, if salvation was about following the law, I had it under that, right? But I regard everything that I gained, all the power, all the influence as garbage, right? Because I didn't have a life until Christ was in it, right? The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus of my law. And he says it's rubbish. It's literally like dog awful um, is, is kind of the, the Greek word, actually. We, we translate it as rubbish, but it's really the awful pile, right? Um, and then, um, so there we are, right? And But he says, and, it, and we can't sit on our laurels. We can't say, oh, that's been done for us. We don't have anything to do. We need to press on so that we might know the more perfect way of knowing God through Christ, right? He presses on for it. Beautiful scripture. I'm glad that we used it in our 90th. We should probably come back and and uh, and live it a little bit better sometimes, right? How about our gospel reading? So we're continuing on in the Gospel of John, and we just celebrated Palm Sunday in the church, and uh, this is John's telling of that entry into Jerusalem on that fateful, that fateful last days of Jesus in his mortal flesh. Let's listen for the word of the Lord from John chapter 12, verses 9 through 19. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The next day... The great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, he was raised from the dead. Then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. What a great reading to leave us as we finish our devotions on this opening day of uh, of Holy Week, right? What was the the what was the uh, the the rumbles uh, in Jerusalem after Jesus comes in and does this triumphal entry as royalty, right? Uh, fulfilling prophecy, but people didn't understand that necessarily at the time, even according to John. And John. Um, is kind enough to say that um, links in this re resurrection of his friend Lazarus uh, and how important that was, that that had created quite the buzz within the community. And so people were coming, saying, who is this Jesus? Is he king? And they, they do crown him king of Israel, right? Because he comes in on this donkey. And, uh, and then it says the reaction to him. And the Pharisees say, oh, we can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. It means everybody has, has uh, 
is uh, interested in this Jesus, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And they're in trouble for two things. Number one, it represents a threat to them and their continuation in their power within the temple. But it also represents a threat because Rome would come down hard and saying, look, this is your religious celebration that everybody's coming together. You're responsible for taking care of your own people. Keep this these people in line. So they're afraid of the retribution of the Romans at the same time. All right, there we go. Um, we spent a lot of time reading yesterday, and then we see John, who is so verbose, right, and seems to say, why should I say it in one thought when I can put it in three? Um, but here is his consolidated version of that uh, triumphal entry. Just a few last few few lines. So, but it's a good it's a good way for us to uh, position ourselves as we are here early in Holy Week. All right. I hope you all have enjoyed our devotions. That you've gained something from it. And absolutely, Judy, we're going to keep all of those all of those folks. Um, just writing stuff them down. Your family and prayers, obviously. Judy, we will do that. Okay. Yes, thank you, Carrie. Hi, Don Jones. Hi, Ellen. Thank you. My understanding is that the, the, the choir is going to work and have a beautiful tribute to Scott during that service. Isn't that good? Hi, Barbara Shoot. Good to see you. Tracy Crutz, good morning to you. All right, I caught up there. So we have a lot of stuff to pray about. And uh, it is, it's a, it's a holy week. You know, as I mean, let's, but let's really make it holy. Let's make it divine. Let's be kind of intentional about this week, right? And um, so we had this focus on Lent, on this penitential thing, and that's important that we bring that into our Holy Week, but really we need to let go of that a little bit so that we can live in to the human, the, the human response that was going on during Holy Week in Jerusalem, right? What was going on so that we can get a better understanding of the enormity of it. So... Um, so we are going to uh, pray, and we're going to mention some people in specific, but we also have prayers for all, so let's remember that, okay? And uh, let's pray. Heavenly God, we thank you for being present with us as we gather today using technology, and as we gather today for the opening of this Holy Week. And we did it under your word. And so, Lord, guide us this Holy Week so that it might be meaningful to us. We're going to be as intentional as we can be about it. We're going to gather for worship on multiple times throughout this week. But really what we're looking for, Lord, is that we might have the transformative experience of Easter, the transformed life of living in this world but not being of it, that we might cling to the Holy Spirit more than we try to cling to the things that we think that we're told are important in this world. So, Lord, uh, as we gather here, our compassions uh, are, to are all bent towards you this week. But, Lord, we also, by doing that, we also feel empathy for the people who have faced loss. So, Lord, we lift up all those who are in need. We want to lift up uh, the Johnson family. On the loss of Scott, we know that he's in the best possible hands on this Easter, the Holy Week, and he's with you. But Lord, we need your comfort, and we need we need the the image of the of the resurrection. And uh, Lord, we want to continue to lift up all who we have prayed for in the past. But today, we lift up Jean Hardwick, who is in the hospital. We ask that you would give healing to her. We also pray for Teresa, Judy Martins. Uh, uh, friend. And Lord, we want to pray for uh, the Hazel family, the Kenochi family, Southern family. Lord, be with them. There's a lot of scary things in the world sometimes, and Lord, sometimes 
we're acting more out of fear than we are out of the actuality of the situation. So, Lord, we pray for your peace, and we pray for your patience. We pray for wisdom, Lord, but we pray for your action, that you might take the hard-hearted and melt them, that, uh, that when people are reaching out, that we might be there for them, so that we will be their support. Lord, we pray for more of your activity in this world on this Holy Week. There's wars that continue on, death and destruction that continues to go, illness and disease that are rampant in the world. Lord, there are people that don't have enough food, don't have shelter. So, Lord, uh, let us commit ourselves to your ideals, that if there's any that are suffering, then we all suffer. Let us take on the suffering of the world this Holy Week. Let us take it on so that we may understand the enormity of the job to be done and how we need you. We need you to fix this. We need your kingdom to rule. That is our prayer. We ask all of this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen all. God bless you. I love you all. Lift you all up in prayer. And uh, God loves you. We all love you here in Allen Park Presbyterian Church. Let us show you how. If you need anything, let us know. And um, But if not, we will see you all here again uh, tomorrow, Tuesday at 9 a.m. for our continuation. God bless you all. Have a great day in the Lord. Bye-bye.